Hello everyone and welcome back to a Pints with Jack Skype session. This week we had been speaking with Daniel and Phil from the Lamp Post Listener and we had been pulling apart the Voyage of the Dawn Treader movie and talking about the things that it does well and the things that are, let's just say, a little bit more problematic. Well, since we were talking about this subject, I really wanted to bring on Glum Puddle from Narnia Web because in preparation to be for... the glummy puddle what, what better topic to be the glummy puddle <laughs> on well I, I watched your videos in anticipation of talking about the movie and i'm so sorry i felt your passion and i thought we need to bring him onto the show and we need to talk at high level what went wrong in this movie w what's bad about it and once we've pulled that apart a little bit i'm just going to ask you what you would have done let's just say in a few months netflix phones you up and say hey are you the, are you the guy from the talking beast podcast we want to hire you as the director for our voyage of the dawn trader movie and wait you mean i can't just i can't just complain i have to actually try <laughs> to do something constructive I, at least i don't know you might be asking too much <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's let's begin with the first question where did this movie go wrong so from a the movie itself or from a, a production point of view? Everything. Why is it that the okay. final product that we had, why was it so lackluster and why did so many Narnian fans look at this and say, this isn't really Narnia? Yeah, well, first off, as far as the movie itself, uh, I was utterly heartbroken uh, when I first saw it. Oh, this is the worst thing ever. I'm so enraged. And now it's been, as of this December, it'll be 10 years. And I don't uh, have the same amount of, same amount of, passionate hate for it i still think it's a bad to mediocre movie um but uh like as a piece of entertainment my entertainment mean the kind of thing you can have on as you're doing your homework or something it's passable but just compared to not just the book absolutely the book but even just the first two movies it just feels like such a cop-out um it feels really disrespectful to definitely the book and the first two movies um uh from a production point of view uh, I think what happened here is obviously Prince Caspian underperformed um, at the box office, um, and uh, Disney dropped um, Narnia, so Walden Media had to find a new, new distributor, and that was Fox. And um, there was never a uh, an artist with a vision. There was never really a storyteller involved in the Don Treader production. Um, there was um, a dozen or so screenwriters and producers and people that had a vague idea of, well, we have to do something that's, you know, not Prince Caspian since that underperformed. And that was about the only thing people agreed on is they didn't want it to be like Prince Caspian. Apart from that, it was a completely all over the place. And generally, I think they never found somebody that really loved the book and wanted to try to bring the book to screen. It was more, okay, we have this set of Legos in the books that we can pull from and not get sued. Um, but that's what having the rights means to them, I guess. And so it was just... Um, and we know we want it to be more magically and more fantasy because there's a little bit less of the magic in Prince Caspian. So that was all there was. And so it was just, there was never really, you know, Andrew Adamson, I don't think the first two Narnia movies are amazing, but I think they're pretty good in part because Andrew Adamson was like, here's the idea of how we're going to make this movie. Mm -hmm. And um, he had kind of got it, kind of got everybody um, on, on the same page of here's what we're trying to do. I don't, I, I don't love all the things Andrew Adamson did, but he was consistent about it and said, here's the vision. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're not doing. And Don Treader was a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And there were so many screenwriters and so many drafts. And from a production point, point of view, I think that's why, um, that's why we ended up with the movie that we did. I, my real sense is that the script that was there it just felt like a first draft. It felt like they had a bunch of ideas, but really hadn't thought about how they were connected. But I remember hearing on your podcast, Talking Beasts, that there was an earlier draft that was leaked. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Because I didn't know about yeah. that before. So there's the early draft of Don, the so-called leaked script that came on, I think, around the time, I think it was around the time Prince Caspian hit theaters. And it's, it's not, in some ways, it's not significantly different. It's just a slightly more extreme version of what we ended up with. Um, like it's, there's, it's not just the green mist and the seven swords. There's also this whole subplot of the, where's the mystery of where the stone knife is. And there's this soul eating cave of doom that sucks the souls in and sends them East. And it's just, it's just a more ridiculous version of, um, of what, what, what ended up in the movie. Um, so I can see what you're saying where it seems like a first draft. What it really is, is every single scene, again, there's, they don't have one person who 
who's really driving the ship, no pun intended, <laughs> telling the story. Um, it's almost every single thing in the movie is a result of a compromise between two or three parties. Uh, mm-hmm. Douglas Gresham being among them of like, well, okay, you give me this. And then, well, then uh, if you do this for me, then I'll have to do this, this for you. And it was more, well, now that's too much. That's too light and silly. Let's have something a little more like this. And everything is a compromise of all these people at the table who are, we're trying to please. Um, and so I think that's why we ended up with a very lackluster movie as opposed to having the storyteller saying, you know, I remember, read, actually, I remember actually reading a review saying it was someone that didn't really like Prince Caspian, but they said Prince Caspian may have been a step in the wrong, excuse me, Prince Caspian may have been a step in the wrong direction, but at least it took that step confidently. And this movie doesn't do that. Yeah. It, there's just too much going on. And also just a lot of things that are very alien to the book, things that were added on, which I found kind of strange given that it's quite a busy book as is. I always felt that they were trying to compensate for the very episodic nature of the book. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You go from island to island to island. And by and large, you could take out those islands and there wouldn't be any great change to you the You could plot. take out pretty much all of them because the overarching plot of, of Don Shredder is... Yeah, I mean, there isn't much of a... I mean, it's, we're trying to find the Seven Lords and hopefully, and maybe we'll make it to Aslan's country. And that's kind of it. Um, so uh, it's... For the movie, and director Michael Apted actually said in an interview that the problem with the book is that it doesn't have a villain, and and I quote, all great adventure stories have to have a villain, Um, which sounds super inspired, right? And and Um, also, is he saying that The Voyage of the Dawn Tread of the book is uh not that great because it doesn't have a villain? Yes, I think that's pretty much what he's saying. Um, (laughs) So... um, yeah, it was more of a, they were trying to add some kind of... Uh, I think it's less about them trying to make it less episodic. That's certainly a big part of it. But more about trying to come up with a, a sexier, overarching plot. Something like, oh, we're, we're trying to find the Seven Lords because it's our duty. And it's the right thing to do. Boring. We need to add a green smoke monster and seven <laughs> swords. Like, that, like uh, who's going to... That'll look cool in trailers. Um, and Aslan's country? Like, well, who cares about Aslan? Why is that cool? I mean, literally, at the end of the movie... Um, Edmund and Lucy, I think it is, they look towards Aslan's country. This is after the Green Mist has been defeated. And they go look towards Aslan's country and they go, well, we've come this far. As if, well, <laughs> I guess we can spare 10 more minutes as long as it's quick, you know. Um, this is Aslan's country! Um, and um, so, yeah, I think uh, in, in, even in the early draft of the script, even though it there details that look different you see them wrestling with, you see them wrestling with those basic problems of what the book is what's really driving the book is just not very exciting from a make make cool trailers point of view again just not I, enough people involved in this movie that really whether or not the book is inherently cinematic or not that like the book like andrew adamson i don't believe understood all the nuances of the narnia books but i do think he really enjoyed them and liked them and mm-hmm. that counts for a lot and wants to communicate something of that yeah was- mm-hmm all the cool Lewis parts of the story seem to be very, very. very oh, much it's downplayed. like they did it. It's like they went the opposite direction on purpose so many times. I'm not saying they did, um, but just like the Lone Island scene, which is um, it absolutely the complete opposite of the book. Um, or even even the uh, uh, Eustace is always praised as, "Wow, you're a dragon, and you're awesome. That's great that you're a dragon." No, 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 no. Being a dragon's a curse. It's the opposite. And the undragoning itself is like very magical and pixie dust and flowery. In the book, it's painful. Mm. Uh, and it's this, this agonizing process of Eustace being changed externally and internally. And it, it some, some of the, so many people want to discuss that scene in depth. Who wants to discuss the undragoning in the book? It's so forgettable. It's sorry, in the, in the movie. movie. Because, yeah, <laughs> um, because in the movie, it's basically just a footnote in the final battle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I think it could have worked with them toying with the timeline and having Eustace undragon towards the end. I really think that could have worked. Yeah. But I just think the execution wasn't there. His attempts to try and undragon himself, it would just sort of look like he had a little bit of an itch and then suddenly yeah, you know, that, Aslan that, claws that at was, sand, he flies up and boom. <laughs> I was trying to throw a bone to the fans. Like if you're an eagle-eyed fan, you'll notice, oh, he was kind of scratching himself there. Um, which is kind of what that I'm means. Like, it's, yeah, it's a great example of the movie where like uh, a lot of things that are so core to the book are basically Easter eggs for fans in the movie. Like the albatross has that quick two-second cameo that no one is going to remember unless you've read the book. Um, and then, yeah, used to scratching himself. There's so many things where it's, you, you're not going to know what that means unless you've read the book. 
Now, before I talk about fixing this, there's one question. I, I wanna know your theory behind this. What was the White Witch or the Green Mist manifestation of the White Witch? What was she trying to tempt Edmund to in this movie? Like hold like well in the in Prince Caspian, she wanted to come back and help Caspian and Peter. Um so I guess there's this sense that she wanted to like I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I try, that, guys, that, I try. Yeah, the the ish, I, again I I think the mist could have worked. I really think it could have. But it, there was no sense to it. Mm-hmm. That why was it collecting these people? Why is it that when the mist is destroyed, they're suddenly then free? What did it even need them for in the first place? Yeah, and that's where when, like I've heard like Jim Fan on the podcast argues that in some ways a leak script works better because it's a it makes because they tie it to the Lady of the Green Kirtle, and so it makes a little more sense. Like maybe that, yeah, that's an example of maybe they're on the. Maybe they're taking a big step in the wrong direction with the least, but at least the least script takes it much more confidently and commits yeah. to it rather than like, wait, what are they doing? It, it mm-hmm. kind of feels like this is a vestige of an idea. Yes. That uh-huh. might have made more sense. It might have been a bit dumb, but it would have at least made coherent sense within the movie. That right. When, since it's such a half hearted attempt, it now just. Exactly. It's just incomprehensible. Exactly. Mm hmm. Well, we ran to for 10 minutes about all of the problems with this, so let's, let's try and be constructive. Oh, no. So, Netflix phone you up. They say, okay, we're not going to do an episodic miniseries for The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. We're just going to try and show the fans what a Voyage of the Dawn Treader movie looks like. Mm-hmm. Which is a shame, because you know, a series could work very well for Dawn Treader in particular. But uh, as far as a movie... now. Having um, torn the filmmakers apart, not just here, but on YouTube and on the podcast for 10 years, um, <laughs> I, I, I want to say that like, um, I, I'm not without sympathy about the fact that there are some parts of the Don Treader book that are, that are tricky to translate the film. I don't think impossible. I think just tricky. For example, people say sometimes, oh, Don Treader is so inherently uncinematic because it's episodic. There are great movies that are episodic. Like Forrest Gump is one of my favorite movies, um, mm-hmm. and there's no overarching plot to it. It's just Tom Hanks doing his thing. Um, and it, it, it's challenging, but it's not inherently uncinematic. Um, so there are aspects like that, that I am out of sympathy with. And I don't have a d- ideas for everything, but one thing I think would help is I've always thought if I made a Don Treader movie, I would make the central dramatic question be, should we go on or should we turn back? And at the beginning of the story, everyone is totally on board, literally on board with, yes, let's let's go find the seven lords. It's the right thing to do. And as the journey goes along and they, they're, they OK, we found a few lords, you know, and um, it starts looking increasingly dangerous. Like I find a way to amp up the danger with every island and it, you get more and more people on the crew saying, you know, this is getting really, really risky. And what? why are we doing this again? Just for the honor of it? I mean. Where's the honor in just dying, you know, for, 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 for no reason, you know, like, it, like the point is to bring the seven lords back. If we just die along the way, who cares? And so you start thinking more practically about it. And then w- w- by the time you get to the end of the journey, you've got Caspian's under a lot of pressure to say, look, we just need to turn back. This is getting too dangerous and really play up the what I love about the book, which is the fear of the unknown, the, the, the simultaneous fear and awe of the unknown it's oh my gosh it's a magical world we're sailing into un- literally unknown waters in a magical world there's no rules we could find absolutely anything um and that's simultaneously amazing and scary and it's the reason i keep turning the pages so really play that up and play up the sense i mean they kind of try in the movie a few times like there's a bit early on where drinian says in this really cheesy pirate accent says something like oh there's tales of sea serpents or whatever and lucy and edmund kind of have oh sorry edmund thinks it's a joke but Lucy has this kind of ominous, you know, ooh, what's going to be out there? They're on the right track there, I think, which is play mm-hmm. up the danger of sailing into the unknown and give the crew more and more reasons to turn back, keep that pressure going. So the central dramatic question of the movie is, is the crew going to keep going or are they going to turn back? And maybe even introduce Reapy Cheap as almost a, as seem, seeming like he's going to be a minor character early on, but then he becomes super essential towards the end. And Reaper Cheap is more, oh, yes, it'd be great to go to Aslan's country, and he's very honor and adventure. And then when we get to the end of the story where they're having this argument in the book about do we go to Aslan's country or not, Reaper Cheap all of a sudden gets kind of vulnerable. Maybe even cries, I don't know. But like, no, I really want to go to Aslan's country. And you realize this is so personal. And, um, and raising the question of why is it so important to go to the end of the world. Why would we want to do that? I might even make make one change from the book and make it so that, because in the book, 
they have to go to Aslan's country in order to wake up the three remaining lords. I might make it so that they get to Ramandu's island, they wake up the lords, oh, the mission's over. We really can turn back now. So it's just a question of, well, do we go into Aslan's country or not, even though it might be dangerous and we don't know what we're going to find or how it's going to work out. Like, you know, the book talks about, you know, Reba imagines the waters of the world endlessly pouring over the sides and they, and someone asks him, well, what will be at the bottom? And he says, I don't know, but whatever happens, won't it be worth anything to have looked even for one moment beyond the edge of the world? And I love, I would love the audience to walk out of the theater or away from the TV screen, whatever it is, um, asking it, kind of having that debate with each other. Like, well, what do you think? Should they go on, gone on or not? And some people being like, I don't think it's worth it. What's the point of going to the world's end? And some people going, but I want to see, I wanted to see us and country. I want to see what it was like and tap into that, um, that, desire to explore the unknown that I think a lot of humans have and the the dissatisfaction with the with this world that humans have that I think Don Shredder and uh that exploration kind of taps into. Um where was I? Um so yeah, so I make it so that the mission's basically accomplished and it's it really does seem like it's on the table to just turn back at that point. Um and really make the central question of the movie be why is exploring Aslan's country worth so much sacrifice what is so exciting about getting to look beyond the world is that really worth is that really worth risking our lives for um so that just it does i don't know how exciting that would be in a trailer but that just sounds a lot more ex- interesting to me than the green mist and and the the swords um that's just i'm not I, I am not a screenwriter i am not saying i could have written a better script than what what we ended up with in the movie i'm, I'm really not a screenwriting is a tricky tricky business especially when you're trying to please so many people and fans of the book um but um yeah that probably something along those lines is what i would have tried i do really like that for many many reasons one it ties in with lewis's own experience of joy zane's the longing mm-hmm. for there's something that's that's beyond exactly and in the recent episodes as i've been talking with matt through the book and daniel and phil through the movie one particular topic seems to have come up much more often than i had ever really considered it before and that's that of heart eustace basically has a heart transplant you know he has a real metanoia a real change inside of him uh, and e- e- even even Reaper Cheap, the, th- the defining characteristic of Reaper Cheap is his heart. Mm. And the one line in the movie that I thought was absolutely wonderful was it right at the end when Aslan says, my country was made for those with hearts such as yours. Hmm. And it's, it's, it's that heart that yearns. Mm-hmm. And I, I've, I've been at sea quite a lot, mm-hmm. and I, I've always found it, slightly terrifying i love it but i also find it slightly terrifying because when you realize what you're doing you're going out into this Mm -hmm. endless endless sea Mm -hmm. seemingly at least Mm -hmm. uh and you feel incredibly vulnerable and i love that idea of should we turn back should we turn back and that would have even nicely fit in with eustace's dragoning because the one of the real issues was we can't keep going because we don't know when we'll next be in, in land. Exactly. And I, I, that's my, some of my fa- I understand why it's hard to do cinematically, but my, some, some of my favorite parts of the book is especially the part where you know they break one of the water kegs and it's um, they just don't know if they're going to find land in time or maybe we've come to an endless ocean. I would love to play up that, that tension and that mystery. Mm-hmm. And in the BBC version, they, they do, do lean they into do. that quite mm-hmm. a bit. Yeah. And, and that, that was one of the scenes as a child, because this used to be my favorite book as a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was one of the scenes that always really stuck with me as to how terrifying that would uh-huh. be to be in the middle of nowhere, sailing in a direction where you don't know if you're actually going to even hit land. Mm-hmm. There might not be any more at this right. point. Uh, and you're running out of water mm-hmm. and you're reaching that point of no return. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it just it, you can't help but ask the question, wait a minute, why are we here? Why is this so important? And um, I, I love the audience having that, the idea of them having that discussion among themselves of well, why is this so important, what they're doing? Mm-hmm. I think we fixed it. All right. <laughs> it, too bad this is for too bad this is for patrons only, huh? No, no, no. We're going to spread this far and wide. <laughs> we're going to make sure that all the people at Netflix see it. Uh, but uh, yeah, no. I I've spent a lot of time over the over the last month or so thinking about what I would change in the movie, or at least what the heart of it that I think needs to be retained in order for it to be a good book. And I the the one good thing movie, I mean. that you focused on is having a driving thrust of the movie, Mm -hmm. which I think it was lacking, ironically, because I think that's what they were trying to solve. Yeah. 
It was there. It just wasn't very compelling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also there was there was very little transition between the islands. It was always like cut next scene. Oh, we're arriving at the yeah, next one. Yeah, and the movie one. is only an hour. It's like an hour and forty five minutes. You know, um, and yeah. Prince Caspian is about two twenty. Um, so that, again, that's more of I think they were. Uh, it's also a lack of confidence in the franchise at this point to say no, we, we can't. You know, we can't go far beyond a hundred minutes. We just have to. Um, keep it very quick. The kids are going to start squirming. Whereas Warjib and Caspian, there was this amount of respect and understanding. This is a broad audience. And this is a very important movie we're making here. Um, and uh, ha- ha- and, having and the giving, confidence giving to the make audi- a longer movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and giving the audience a chance to react to the actor's reaction rather than simply the actor telling us it, what we're meant and to there's a lot of that. there's a lot of that going on in Don Treader, is the actors telling us what's going on in case we missed it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, the dragon has landed on our mast. It might break yeah. it. Really? <laughs> oh, look, the spell has lifted. Oh, you mean that massive uh, pyrotechnic sky beam that went up and suddenly we can see all of the people in front of even, It's like, we know it's broken. And even, oh, I forgot. That's another example of the blue laser shooting up in the sky that shows up in oh, so, so many I, movies. I, even, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> I lost it when I saw that. I, 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 I saw it coming. I saw it coming. It was because that, that was after the Eustace transformation, which just did the generic... Beauty and, and the Beast yeah, transformation. It, it, it's like, ugh, they are not thinking about this. They're going to do a sky beam. See, when, so when that's funny because for me, I had that same reaction to Eustace's transformation. But as soon as he starts, I think it was the music. It was very early on in the scene. I went, oh, tell me he's not going to do Beauty and the Beast. Please don't do that. And, or Shrek, <laughs> whichever whichever reference you want. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah. I don't even think, I, I think I watched it like this uh, the, the first time. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, mm-hmm. Brian, for coming on this Skype session and telling us what was wrong with the Voyage of the Lone Treader and how it needs to be fixed next thank time. You. Assuming it does actually happen. Yes. Uh, before we wrap up, would you mind telling everybody about your website, your podcast? And everything sure. The else? website is narniweb.com. And um, our mission is to uh, provide the latest Narni movie news, especially um, the upcoming Netflix productions. Uh, we also want to connect everyone who loves the Chronicles of Narnia with a community. We just launched, launched a new discussion forum today and also amplify the voices of people, uh, of fans that want, um, these books to be, want the filmmakers to treat these books with the respect they deserve. Um, and then, um, I have, a. We have a podcast called Talking Beasts, the Narnia podcast, which is we're in between seasons right now, but during the season, that's twice on the sev- every 7th and 17th. Um, and every episode, we explore and find new meaning in the world of C.S. Lewis and keep a close eye and react to uh, the latest Narnia movie news. Mm-hmm. Wonderful mm-hmm. stuff. Thanks, Thanks again. David. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>